Uh, he's the author of more than 30 books. Uh, many of you know uh, some of those books, including Eyes of the Skin, which is required reading here. Yohani uh, has uh, also been, uh, one thing I didn't mention last night, he's uh, been an educator, uh, really, most of his life. He was the rector for the Institute of Industrial Design in Helsinki, when two of the faculty members were Kapio uh, Birkela and Kai Frank, uh, two of the most famous industrial product designers in the world. Um, so today, what we're going to do is something a little different, is talk a little bit more about his theoretical work and his writing, and uh, you can ask him any questions that you'd like. Last night was a little daunting getting, getting up in front of the whole audience, so we'll make it a little more comfortable today. Um, uh, I should mention, uh, if you weren't there last night, that uh, he's, uh, Yohani is only writing now, he's closed his architectural practice. If you were there last night, you saw one of his last works, a concert hall. Um, but we're very excited to have him here today, and uh, with that, Johanny Palosma. And he wants me to keep him company here. So I'll you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. In your essay, Place and Image, uh, which forwards Marlon Blackwell's work of the 2005, you highlighted evidence of the interplay between contemporary architectural vocabulary, timeless vernacular vocabulary, and the expression of local specificity in his work. You mentioned that this births an architectural hybridity that is often lacking in the narrative of works by contemporary practitioners. Do you believe that an architect can produce truly thoughtful and meaningful work out of an egotistical drive or preconceived notions of style? Well, as it happens, I have written early essays, uh, in some cases the first essays on some of the leading American regionalist architects nowadays, uh, uh, like uh, Rick Joy in Tucson, Marlon Blackwell in uh, Fayetteville, uh, Arizona, but also in, in Canada, uh, Brian McKee Lyons. I have written a couple of essays on, on him. And um, for instance, when I first met uh, Marlon, he was a country boy from uh, Arkansas. Uh, his behavior, <coughs> ego and way of dressing was that of a country boy. But now, now he's an he's a international uh, figure. Uh, it has been very interesting to see uh, his uh, pers personal ch chains uh, and then also the chains of his, uh, his architecture that uh, now uh, is uh, very, very refined, I must say. The uh, architecture building and design building in Fayetteville is probably the finest school, architecture school, I have seen anywhere in the world. Uh, it's so uh, fine, uh, uh, how would I say, fusion of uh, an old building and, and, and a new building. And um, I think, uh, as I have emphasized, uh, the importance of uh, discovering oneself for a designer or an, or an artist. In many ways, our work is uh, a way of discovering yourself. But in order to uh, start uh, even, you, you need to, to uh, become conscious, conscious of, of yourself, who you are. And uh, when you, you are conscious of yourself, or become conscious of yourself, your early childhood memories uh, become very important because uh, all we can genuinely work, work on are our experiences and memories. Uh, it's useless to uh, look at books uh, when you are designing. That can't help you. 
only things that have become part of you can help you because they, they are the source of uh, your uh, creative capacity. I once had a chance of having dinner with uh, famous uh, Basque Spanish sculptor Eduardo Schilda, one, one of the finest sculptors of last century, at a wise man, wise enough to have published a book to be, together with uh, Martin Heidegger, the philosopher. During the uh, dinner, he said to me, I have never had any use for what I have done before when I start a new, uh, new work. That was quite a confession from, uh, of humility and sort of insecurity from a man who, who is definitely at the top of his profession in the entire world. You just have to go to point zero, otherwise you, uh, you be become repetitious and your, your work becomes, uh, becomes uh, sterile. One of the wor words that I uh, almost hate, I get feel feeling of aggression whenever I hear the word expert. When I hear that somebody is expert of something, I know this guy doesn't know anything about the world. He might know something about a tiny bit, but what is that information? What's the value of that information? It, if it's not contextualized with an understanding of the world and human, human life. So as an answer to you, your, your question, uh, as designers, we have, to, we have to aim at universal qualities, unless the result is useless. If it just speaks about you, it's not worth doing. Uh, it has to have something that has an echo in, in uh, humanity at large and the his historicity of uh, the human, human being. So I'm saying this as an answer to your question. Uh, you, you have to begin from uh, the reality of your own life and past and uh, setting and cultural setting and geographic setting and architectural setting and then refine that into something which has uh, more general qualities and, and values. Who, who spoke? Martin Heidegger. Yes. Um, in his uh, work, The Thing, talked about international travel and mass media causing a shrinking distance and um, leading, this leading to a diminished proximity to our own existence. Um, what role do you think architecture should play in uh, allowing the user or the person experiencing architecture to uh, get in touch with their own existence, apart from just the architect becoming more aware of themselves. Um, how do you feel the user should be targeted in this endeavor? You are asking the most fundamental question about architecture, I think. Uh, the task of architecture is to create horizons uh, and frames of understanding, understanding the world and yourself. So architecture has two, two perspectives. And uh, by doing so, uh, architecture articulates the lived reality. Uh, we believe that reality is uh, something self-evident uh, in our everyday life. Uh, Giorgio Morandi, the great uh, Italian painter of small, tiny still lifes, has a line when he says, nothing is more abstract than reality. Uh, it is the abstraction of reality that, that architecture needs to concretize for all, all of us. And uh, uh, then also uh, Wittgenstein, in his notes, um, 
writes that architecture eternalizes and dignifies something. If there is uh, nothing or when there is nothing to eternalize or dignify, there is no architecture. And I think that I feel strongly that in the consumer societies, the wo our world is becoming experientially uh, impoverished of uh, uh, essential values of uh, experiencing essential things about human life. And while this is happening, uh, also architecture is being impoverished. It doesn't have much to say anymore. It, it is turning into a visual rhetoric. Uh, that's the shallowness in even the most skillful works of art to, uh, architecture today is that uh, they, are, they project skill, technical skill, perhaps uh, visual compositional skill, but there is no content because there is no content in human life in the consumer society. When we become consumers of our own lives, as we are doing, and, and our uh, you know, economic uh, structures all around the world are, are uh, desperately trying to do, do that, turn us into consumers of our own lives. Uh, so the task of architecture is not to uh, uh, how would I say, continue or strengthen those uh, unhuman characteristics in our country, uh, in our culture. Architecture, in my view, has to be in resistance. Art is in resistance. That's the essence of, uh, of uh, modern art since uh, the beginning of last century, that it is a res resistance to seeing things uh, in a too simplified manner, as our culture tends to do. Life is much more complicated than, than what our culture tends to make us believe. I don't know whether this answers, but uh, your question. <laughs> I think the, just a, a, a further note to my answer is that uh, in the world of art, literature, cinema, architecture, uh, the issues have to be grounded in, on existential ground. They have to have human experiential meaning, otherwise they are just aesthetics. And uh, we have become a totally aestheticized uh, culture in we live in a culture where personality, politics, and even war have been uh, aestheticized. The Gulf War was the first aestheticized war which was broadcast around the world as television entertainment. That's rather horrifying. But so for me, aestheticization is, uh, is uh, a negative notion. I often say that architecture is threatened today by two opposite forces. On one hand, total functionalization. On the other hand, total aestheticization. Hey, Thanks for being here. Um, I have this formulating in my head. Um, so I, th I think why I really appreciate you being here is because of uh, the contrast of what you have to offer versus what me personally I'm doing in the studio. Um, and I, I really appreciate your focus on self and um, exploring not just to learn for learning's sake, but learning for what you want to do for yourself. Um, I also really appreciate your focus on craftsmanship, and I'm wondering, um, this is kind of unrelated, the formulation did not happen, but 
I'm wondering, uh, in, in your in your efforts for writing, you say you, you write every day. Um, I'm wondering if you're writing for others or if you're writing for yourself. I start by quoting the South African writer Kurt C, uh, who won the Nobel Prize of Literature about 12 years ago. He says bluntly, Thinking about the reader is a deadly error for a writer. Uh, because if a writer thinks too much about the reader, the text just turns into entertainment. Uh, and the same applies to architecture. Architecture has to have uh, a certain degree of autonomy, uh, otherwise it turns into just uh, commercial service, uh, like a lawyer's service. Uh, it, and this uh, autonomy is based on the existential ground, again, on, of architecture and personal e experience. Uh, uh, when I write, I don't write to myself, but I don't write to the reader either. The writing is a kind of a, a process of search, like taking a walk in, through a forest and then trying to see what, what I see and, and uh, recording it on, in, on the, in the text. When uh, Scott used the word theory, I'm, I'm always I feel uneasy when I hear the word because I don't believe in theory. I believe in observation and experience. I'm not writing about theory, I'm writing about my experiences, which I have. I'm not uh, writing or speaking about the thing I saw yesterday. I think about, I speak about and write about things that I have uh, carried with inside me for decades and which have matured into a personal belief. Um, so writing has become to me, a big, uh, um, turned uh, into a semi-autonomous process for me. Uh, when I began writing in the late 60s, Writing was always a pain for me. I suffered, I ached, and I sweated. And, but one day in the uh, mid-70s or so, I, I realized that when I sketch an architectural project or sketch anything, I'm not suffering, I'm, I'm happy. I must have some uh, false attitude in my writing, and then I analyzed my writings and, and realized that I had the tendency to think that I have to have a theory which I prove to the reader through my writing. And then I realized when I, I'm sketching, I'm not, I don't have a theory and I'm not proving anyone else, uh, any, anyone, anything. And at that point, moment, I decided I will uh, write in the same way I sketch. And I, on that very moment, very same day, writing be became pleasurable for me because it's the same kind of discovery, process of discovery as sketching is. I never write an outline because the outline would, uh, you know, kill the, kill the automatic uh, process of discovery. Uh, so my answer is, I, I'm I'm uh, writing for the process of writing because of the process of writing itself. Uh, I also wish to add that Milan Kundera, the uh, Czech writer, uh, famous one, he uh, writes often about the wisdom of the novel and uh, he argues that 
uh, novels are always wiser than the writers. And then he said, suggests, if a writer feels that he is wiser than what he has written, he should change his profession. Uh, I'm not as wise as my writings, it's exactly because of this, that there is an uh, autonomous quality about it, and there has to be. Otherwise, they wouldn't be worth writing. Was this an answer to your question? <laughs> Maybe uh, before we go to your next, uh, let me just say one, one thing more. Uh, in, in my early writing career, I was concerned with the rational intellectual precision with, uh, the sen uh, of the sentences. Then I realized that uh, this intellectual precision that tends to close the, the channels of the observer, uh, of, of the reader, and, and just, uh, you know, make, make uh, her or, or, or him uh, grasp the intellectual message. And I began, began to pay attention to the literary quality, the quality of uh, language. And now I write everything at least 10 times, and uh, Towards the end, uh, I'm more and more concerned with the literary qualities. Uh, in the final round, it's just about adjusting the literary, you know, uh, how would I say, almost sound of the of the rhythm of the language, because the uh, quality of language opens up the uh, reader's emotive channels, and then you have a, a, an audience, whereas for an uh, intellectual argument, uh, uh, it's a different audience. Sorry to delay your uh, question. That's all right, thank you very much. Um, it's clear from your writings and what you showed last night that you care a great deal about the mental uh, state that your creations generate in the people that experience them. And I was wondering if you've ever had the opportunity or the, the challenge of creating a space for individuals with mental difficulties. For example, someone with dementia, or someone with autism, or someone with depression. And how would you go about doing something along those lines? That's again an important uh, question. For me, it was essential that in, when I returned from Africa after two and a half years in teaching in Africa, I returned to Helsinki, I was invited to a conversation group which consists of, consisted of a couple of leading architects in Finland, a leading poet, a priest, and three therapists. And the tone of the, these were Jungian therapists, and uh, the tone of the, uh, and, and then the dean of the philosophy department. The, we met uh, every uh, second month, and each one took a turn to give a talk uh, to start a conversation. Uh, the tone of the conversations was very much uh, not dominated by guide, but guided by the therapists in, in the group, and that is the moment when I began to understand the continuity uh, from the inner world to the outer world, to understand that there is no opposition. The, there is no opposition uh, between I and the world. That's a continuum. And uh, uh, I began to see architecture increasingly as a mental phenomenon. Uh, as opposed to to a visual uh, material object. Uh, then uh, I guess it was uh, uh, John Dewey's famous book, Art as Experience, which when I read that, which opened my eyes to understand that uh, an art artistic dimension is not in the painting or sculpture or in the built space. 
it is the mental uh, mental experience of that uh, that work, and I'm on that that uh, road still. The confrontation, not confrontation, encounter with therapists, um, which was rather intense. I gave lectures in therapy uh, co courses uh, about art and architecture to, for my, I mean, the therapist friends invited me. Uh, then uh, that led me to phenomenological philosophy. And when I realized the existence of phenomenological philosophy, I realized that I have, I have been a phenomenologist since my childhood. And as I uh, said to Scott uh, yesterday, I feel that I'm a, uh, I, I, my writings are country boys' phenomenology. Uh, Husserl, the founder of, uh, of uh, phenomenological philosophy, uh, describes phenomenology as pure looking. And as a country boy, I exercise, practice pure looking uh, to fight the boredom of five years, or solitude of five years. And th those were really important years for me and, and still vitalize my, my being at the age of 82. Um, yes, also my teacher and mentor, Professor Blomstedt, who was a, uh, was a great uh, scholar in uh, proportion, proportional harmony. He elaborated a, uh, I would say, the finest proportional system, which is entitled Cardon 60, based on Pythagorean thinking. Uh, he, uh, he explained to me that the original meaning of uh, the word theory, the Greek word theorein, is means to be looking at, not speculating. So the, uh, the word of theorein originally means exactly the same, to be intensely looking at something. So I accept being a theoretician in, in that sense, but not in the, in the usual sense of a scientific theory and and to my understanding increasingly the more I understand the more impossible it becomes to me to see uh, that there could be a theory of architecture simply because architecture is consists of so many just tens hundreds of contradictory uh, areas and categories it cannot be theorized, it, it can be lived. Uh, I have written sometimes that uh, to me nowadays, a theory of architecture is equally impossible and useless as a theory of life would be. I'm, I'm not uh, speaking against a, 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 an intellectual uh, approach uh, to, to architecture and art. I'm merely uh, saying that there can be only partial theories, there can be only partial intellectualizations about such a complex phenomenon as arch architecture, uh, but not, not the entire phenomenon. Uh, there is one paradoxical essence of architecture to start with, that is, architecture is the, the means and the end at the same time. And architecture, to be architecture, authentic, it has to be something that nobody has uh, experienced before. It has to have that, that freshness of uh, experience, although it is based on the historicity of human mind, still the actuality in, in, in a building has to have that freshness. So, I'm, although I'm called a theoretician, I don't believe in it. Does what I'm saying 
you understand my language and my the course of my thinking? Yes. Uh, my question is about uh, the body and phenomenology historically, but also in terms of contemporary bodies. So if the body has changed, and you may think that it hasn't, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on that. Will there be a new phenomenology for a contemporary body? That's a good, good question. As I said, we are historical beings. Uh, we are still subject to evolution. The reason why most of you probably have a problem with uh, your teeth that that they it gets too crowded in the mouth for teeth and uh, that is because when we ate uh, raw meat some tens of thousands of years ago until fire was tamed about 60,000 years ago uh, we needed much more, much more muscle power and, and jaw power, and our jaw uh, was bigger. Now that we uh, eat softer food and have been doing so uh, long enough in evolutionary terms, our jawbone has become much smaller, but our, our number of teeth has not changed. Uh, nature, our growth, needs to fit the same number of teeth uh, as uh, the Neanderthal man had in his, his mouth. But they can't fit into our mouth anymore. I'm giving this uh, as an example how evolution still works and uh, uh, how uh, the human body works, how uh, body changes. The invention of fire also changed our uh, stomach bacteria. Uh, things like that uh, keep changing the human being. And um, I have become increasingly interested in our biological past and uh, evolutionary past because those are the real things uh, in, in uh, human uh, life and, and future, we should not be, be too uh, negligent about uh, uh, these evolutionary processes that still continue. Uh, uh, yes, I would su uh, suggest and I believe that the architecture uh, will turn towards uh, biology uh, uh, forcefully in the coming few, few years. When my university in Helsinki, the Helsinki University of Technology was revised into uh, Aalto University, carrying the name of the great countryman of mine, Alvar Aalto, and uh, it was based on unification of three universities, the University of Technology, University of Design, and University of Economics. I was very disappointed. What, what an old-fashioned idea to just uh, reinforce the forces that already exist and guide modern industrial societies. So what's the point in terms of uh, evolution of science or, or or academic understanding, I suggested, or I would have, uh, I would have combined uh, technology and biology, and uh, this would have uh, become a, a new concept for for a university. My strong understanding is that universities should not support uh, the uh, status quo or power of the industrial economic uh, combination. Uh, universities should be critical of it. And when universities uh, lose the, uh, their uh, intellectual autonomy, we are in trouble. 
I'm not saying that uh, universities should not collaborate with industries, that's another thing. But uh, having industries dictate what is taught uh, in universities is completely, completely wrong. I would also say it is completely wrong that American Institute of Architects has a say in, uh, in uh, accepting uh, architectural uh, curricula. It's not the task of a uh, profession to sort of, uh, uh, how do I say, cement uh, fixed professionalist ideas. Universities need to liberate from ourselves and young, young minds from such fixed uh, ideologies. These are rather rough uh, arguments, but uh, in the name of honesty, I, I have to make them. I've been a university rector so also, so I, the uh, rector of the University of Industrial Design, so, so I, I know s somewhat what I'm talking about. So I have a question for you about your most recent writing, where you've been collaborating with scientists and with others who are really interested in the brain, how we think, how we experience, how that relates to architectural design and, and, and the art. But I, it, to me, it's fascinating. And so I have a question for you that is uh, something that I've brought up occasionally with some of these students in Architecture 101, just the very beginning, when we talk about perception. And so perception is very much about the brain something that we learn from a child learns yeah, yeah, that perception. What? Perception. Perception. Yeah. How we see, how we learn depth, how we see space, how we experience. Of course, for me as an educator, how do we draw, how do we represent? Um, and you know, also perception is cultural. And an example of that is research where finding, and it's no longer really possible, but a hundred years ago you could find uh, cultures that had never seen a photograph and the reaction was horror because no one really knew how to respond to a photograph. Fast forward to 2020, you know, 2018, we're overwhelmed with Im images that never existed and now we have images everywhere, color images, moving images, films, and the question is, so in a world of images, are we visually more sophisticated, or are we completely visually desensitized? That's again an important question. I believe that every human being, healthy human being, uh, sees in a, a similar way, sees the same things in a situation until I learn to teach in Africa, in Ethiopia for two and a half years. And I uh, began to uh, suspect that my students did not see what I saw. And I made a series of ex experiments, particularly with my eldest uh, student, oldest student who was an army uh, lieutenant. And uh, he, he had uh, used his uh, eyesight for observation in the art artillery, I, my assumption was that he must uh, see clearly and truthfully. But my e e little experiments show, showed that he didn't. He didn't. He, he couldn't see perspective, for instance. And uh, then I f found a book uh, uh, at that time, exactly on this uh, subject matter, the, it was called uh, Vision and Culture, uh, an anthropological study by a group uh, led by Herskovitz, uh, an anthropologist, uh, which um, clearly showed and proved that this was not the case. Uh, I mean, the, that uh, vision is uh, culturally conditioned. We see what we are, what we learn, have learned to see. And in the case of the studies of Herskovitz, 
there was a fundamental difference between uh, tribes in Africa or anywhere else that have grown up in a, a jungle condition where there is no horizon uh, available um, to, to, to be experienced and attuned with and then uh, compared with uh, people, uh, tribes that live on plains that have a, have a horizon. Uh, fundamental, fun, fundamentally different uh, uh, mechanisms of seeing. But then recent studies also have revealed uh, how unreliable eyewitness statements are in court simply because we see what we want to see. And uh, one reason, uh, one task of t uh, in teaching drawing is to re-educate us to see, to see things that we normally do not see. Um, I have a friend who is teaching at the University of uh, Virginia in Charlottesville. She's a Romanian uh, artist who teaches drawing through touch. The uh, students are asked to uh, put their hands in a uh, black canvas bag, bag and then draw what they feel through their hand. And those drawings are extraordinary. And, uh, they reveal aspects of uh, physical familiar objects that we simply do not see. Uh, and I'm, since we are uh, obsessed with, with vision, uh, our entire, entire culture is more, more uh, visually uh, dominated than human culture ever in, in, in history. For instance, uh, in the uh, 16th century as historians uh, uh, prove or, or people heard first, hearing was number one, uh, sense and smell was number two, sense, vision was uh, the third in, in, in hierarchy. Now there is no question which is the num number one. Of course, theoretically, or philosophically, the hegemony of the eye already begins with uh, uh, Greek philosophers. Uh, Aristotle uh, named the five senses and also gave the hierarchy from vision uh, down to touch. Uh, and his argument was that touch is the lowest of the senses because even animals uh, feel by, by their skin. Uh, which was a bit uh, uh, too hesitant uh, conclusion. Uh, one could have also made the, the reverse uh, judgment that uh, touch is important because it, it has the deepest uh, biological grounding, which is the case. Um, so I, I would say in the way as many uh, philosophers who uh, study, have studied the senses that we are to rediscover our uh, neglected senses. I am of the opinion that um, touch, particularly the internalized or hidden touch in vision is our most important uh, sense. As Maurice Merleau-Ponty writes beautifully, through vision we touch the sun and the stars. Hmm? Beautiful sentence, idea. Uh, yes, through vision we also touch architecture, but we have forgotten that. And often also architectural education has forgotten the hiding touch that is in vision. And that is why our architecture is almost always uh, rather hostile to the, to the desire of the eye to touch. Uh, 
Nietzsche, uh, for instance, speaks about how, how the eye wants to touch. Yes, our eyes want to touch, but contemporary architecture does not give uh, pleasurable surfaces or edges or materials for that desire. Where that's why we love so much old cities and, and old buildings, because they provide this uh, stimuli for, for this unconscious touch. Um, I don't know whether this answers your question. I, I would say desensitized, because simply as uh, uh, Alba Noe, the radical philosopher in California, argues in the very title of one of his late news books is, Is Vision a Mere Illusion? Mere illusion. Of course it's an illusion. Uh, the world uh, as we see it ex exists in that manner only in our vision. Not as a physical reality. As a physical reality, you, you know it's something else. Finally, it's atoms. Uh, now, these are. Uh, I I think that what we call progress can often be uh, also a, a negative uh, development, uh, particularly in the case when progress be becomes reductive in, in some way or the other. Um, well, Paul Virilio, the architect, philosopher in France, he says, the most important product of contemporary societies is speed. That's a horrifying thought, but when you stop to think about it, he, he, there's a truth, there is a seed of truth in it. So uh, we should, as architects and artists, become critical and more conscious of what the reality is because the task of architecture, in my view, is to strengthen our experience of reality, not to weaken it. Architecture is not needed to make, make uh, stage sets or a fictional rea uh, reality. We need a str strong sense of reality in order to dream. Dreams arise from that foundation. Um, this question is going to be honest in your words. In 2008 or 2009, I'm not exactly sure, Peter Eisenman in an interview stated that architecture has lost its, its authority. Um, as someone who has seen the rise and fall of periods like paper architecture and star architects, um, do you believe that architecture has lost its authority? Yes, it does. Definitely. It has its... Uh, it, it has lost at least much of its cultural uh, authority, but it has also lost much of its uh, author authority as uh, a human experience. Uh, it, when architecture turns into uh, utility, which is very often the case, it disappears. Architecture is not utility. Uh, Purely, there has to be a larger, more metaphysical message, philosophical, human me message, existential message to architecture in order to qualify as architecture. Um, the, the loss of authority is also exactly in the word, hiding in the word expert. Architects have become experts of what? Uh, make, making drawings for construction site. Uh, but they have lost uh, their capacity and authority 
to, to uh, conceive architecture as, uh, uh, as art, as a human, human existential message. Very much so, I would say. There are, of course, examples. There are, I mean, exceptions. There are always exceptions. But um, the authority of architecture is very much in, uh, in its autonomy. Ar architecture needs uh, to uh, do a fu functional or utilitarian and cultural service to the society, but it also needs to have its artistic autonomy. It has to continue the narrative of architecture uh, with, with certain degree of independence from what uh, either uh, today's aesthetics or uh, utilitarian needs uh, call, call for. Uh, yes, I, he, here I agree with Peter Reisenman and I do not agree with Peter Reisenman in many many issues, but here I do. Peter uh, has also uh, guided architecture towards uh, intellectualization away, away from the, you know, the sensory uh, world and uh, somewhat also away from, from its uh, historical roots to uh, pure intellectualization and, and pure composition, which composition in itself is, doesn't have a content. The content has to come from uh, the human life, a sense of life. As Konstantin uh, uh, Brancusi, the great uh, uh, sculptor, one of the greatest of all time, he, he says, has a sentence where he says, a work of art needs to give the shock of life immediately uh, a sense of breathing. It is exactly this sense of life, a sense of breathing that uh, is needed in architecture. And uh, I do not have that sense in, in the conceptual, more conceptual or orientation of architecture. Not, not also the orientation, uh, minimalist orientation that takes uh, the minimalist uh, uh, language as a preconcept. Uh, Rancusi, who was a minimalist himself, he also says or writes that uh, simplicity cannot be a starting point in art. It's the end result. Uh, simplicity uh, and abstraction is the end result of, of often very long and laborious uh, process of uh, Condensation and reduction. It's not the starting point. Yesterday, you mentioned that you don't think that we should try to plan our lives and that you didn't intend to be an architect. Could you elaborate on the internal journey of deciding to become an architect? And another slightly related question is what role does the architect play in planning the experience for the occupant? or so, letting, uh, planning the experience for the architect yes. versus letting them have their own experience and kind of taking ownership over that themselves? Well, I, as I mentioned yesterday, I did not plan to become an architect. Uh, in all sincerity, I cannot know. I do not know why I walked to the architecture school. One of my uh, aunt, uh, aunts who died at the age of 90 uh, was interested in uh, studying the, uh, you know, the origins of uh, our family and she found out that uh, the famous Finnish woman architect who was one of the three first female architects in the in the entire world who graduated from university in Helsinki in 1892. 
she was uh, uh, a relative of mine, so uh, the, you know, this is just uh, almost a joke, uh, but it, it could be that there is some kind of a gene that uh, traveled to me at the moment that I aimed at entering <laughs> the medical school. Uh, no, this uh, human faith is, is interesting, and uh, as I suggested yesterday, uh, you, one needs, needs to keep the, all the possibilities open. I would not absolutely be here if I had uh, chosen to be a medical doctor. I would be somewhere else. I haven't, wouldn't have written my 60 books on art and architecture. I chose medicine. I might have written books on some other subject, but those um, it, it is interesting to uh, think every now and then uh, of one's own alternative, uh, you know, uh, paths of, of life. If I had chosen that, you know, if I didn't meet that person that very moment. I would have gone somewhere else and my entire life would have changed. That's also the essence of uh, uh, design work, is that it's not a closed path. It's uh, every design work has uh, tens, hundreds, thousands of uh, forking paths. And each one of those paths leads to you to a, to a different uh, solution. That is why when uh, you give a program to students or in a competition, the projects are usually quite different, simply because the complexity of decision making and complexity of human mental life has guided each one to a different uh, orientation. So, I repeat, don't uh, make too strong decisions on what you want to become. When I go to my to the meetings of my uh, high school class, uh, almost all the other classmates of mine decided early on what they want, wanted to become. Either they have reached what they decided or they haven't, and in both cases, they are unhappy. I'm the one who hasn't made any decisions. I've just faced uh, reality, and I'm the happy one. <laughs> so simply just to give another formulation to the idea, life is far, far too complex to be scripted. When you script life, you, you, uh, you know, truncate life, make an invalid life. <laughs> Thank you, you might for being here. Um, uh, I want to ask a really simple question. Uh, or actually, a couple of them. The both simple ones. Uh, one, what's your favorite object that you've ever had or been around? And second, what's your favorite perceptive experience that you've ever had? The favorite? Uh, perceptive experience. Perceptive. Well, I, I usually have a Nautilus shell uh, on my working table. You know the, it's a cut, a Nautilus shell which uh, coils out uh, in, uh, in a mathematical sequence. That's a magical thing to see the order, the complex complexity of order in nature. I'm stimulated by things like that. Uh, as a design man-made object, uh, I have a favorite ob object and it is a, a carving knife designed by Tapio Virkala, my, my friend, the legendary Finnish, Finnish designer. It, it is pure beauty. And uh, the marvel about that object is that 
usually uh, individual designers cannot improve traditional tools simply because they have already brought to near perfection by tradition. Uh, similarly, if you see uh, designer violins, they, they look almost ridiculous. Violin has uh, grown through uh, centuries of violin playing. Um, but this knife by my friend is, is so beautiful, astonishingly beautiful. Uh, so individual designer in that case, who was a uh, master craftsman himself, could still improve on a traditional project, uh, both uh, in, in a utilitarian sense and, and aesthetically. Um, you had two parts uh, in, in the question. Uh, what's your favorite perceptive experience you've ever had? That, that's very difficult to say, but I answer it in the way that I have certain uh, works of art. I always go to see uh, uh, Brancusi's uh, bird in flight if there is a museum in town that has one of those. When I'm in, in Venice, I always go to Academia uh, Gallery to see the uh, Tempiesta, the storm uh, painting uh, by Giorgione. Um, if there is a, any one of the 32 paintings of Vermeer in town, I will always go to see, see the one that is there. There are certain, uh, I would always go to see a, a, a Piero della Francesca piece if they the were around. There are certain artists that, that simply have reached a, a perfection in their craft. And they are so noble things to see, they, as great pieces of art always, they uh, dignify your own sense of yourself. And um, I often say to my students that the miracle of art is that it enables you to see through the eyes of Piero della Francesca or, or Fermer. Art enables you to feel through the skin of Michelangelo or, uh, or uh, poetry enables you to feel through the heart of Rilke. Uh, take advantage of, uh, of uh, feeling through the heart of Rilke, for instance. It's really dignifying. Hi, this is building off of Mark's question a little bit. Um, in one of your lectures, you said uh, when you enter a work of architecture, it enters you. And this statement was one of the most extraordinary things I've ever heard. Um, I'm wondering if there is a piece of architecture that has entered you and never left. Well, this, this is just a phenomenological truth, uh, which um, res uh, is a result of the fact that our mental world and the external world are a continuum. I use the visual metaphor of uh, the Merbius strip, you know, the Merbius strip, which is a fantastic object. It has two sides but one surface. I think the Merbius strip is closest uh, as in, you know, uh, visual model to, to uh, demonstrate this continuum from the inner to the to the outer, and uh, the, this idea of uh, uh, the space entering me and me while I enter the space is is uh, uh, it, it's not a, a, a metaphor; it's it's an actual thing 
which you can observe in yourself when you become sensitive enough to that experience. Um, the, altogether, uh, the, the, uh, it is also true what, what Richard Neutra in his book uh, uh, Survival Through Design in 1954, he um, uh, predicted that architecture changes our neural, uh, uh, neural system. Today's uh, neurological studies show that this actually happens. Uh, we re uh, react to our environment uh, through adaptation, uh, either slow, long-term adaptation, uh, as in uh, evolution, or rather quick adaptation through neural uh, echo or attunement. We neurologically attune ourselves with places and spaces and, and situations. So that's a rather, um, how would I say, uh, a thought that at least has stopped me a number of times to know or realize that what I have designed has changed the neural constitution of other people. But that is true, that is scientifically true. Um, from what you have been saying, it seems that the past year um, in design school is that architecture is very intentional and meaningful. Do you think fast architecture is architecture? As in like, just like the way we've been producing like so many buildings with so much more like functional um, intent, not really like designing. Do you consider that actual architecture or just something that's simply maybe for architecture? Well, if I understand your question uh, correctly, architecture the word is used in two, two meanings. One is just referring to buildings. The other uh, meaning is referring to distinct qualities in, in buildings. The latter would uh, make a distinction between uh, buildings that have the quality level of architectural impact or influence as opposed to ones that are meaningless and most buildings are truly meaningless or have negative meanings. It's a sobering thought that every single structure and building, man-made structure in our surroundings is a product of human imagination. Someone has imagined everything that we see around but it's rather sad to, uh, to see how a little uh, gentleness and understanding and goodwill uh, there is in these decisions. Most of it is ugliness, but none of that ugliness in the environment is accidental. It's uh, a product of human imagination ugly human imagination that has not been refined by uh, an aesthetic uh, or humane cultured intention. Uh, uh, yes, uh, for, in my view, teaching architecture is fundamentally uh, an issue of sensitizing students to see the quality, qualitative dimension in construction and see how many-sided that uh, quality can be. We tend to see it only as an aesthetic surface, but it's far deeper than that. Good architecture 
takes us back, for instance, to the entire evolutionary history of humankind. A really powerful building like Louis Kahn's buildings make our uh, consciousness and, and heart uh, have an echo with something that is very primordial and, and, and ancient. Um, so, uh, architecture, uh, again I repeat my, my notion for the fundamental architectural qualities are not aesthetic, they are existential. They put you into resonance with the story of humanity. It sounds like, you know, a grandiose way of speaking, but that's the only way I can express it. When you visit uh, examples of real, real architecture, uh, you know what I mean to say. You, you, you are facing something that is much larger and bigger than architecture itself. Right, so my question is kind of involving in my favorite two chat on my favorite two pages of your book, Thighs of the Skin, and the section of Spaces, Memory, and Imagination. And today, well, in your section you cover that we formulate space and memory and imagination, and now we're talking about reality of what we've talked about today. So my question is, how do you design architecture to invoke spaces in all these three categories? Sorry, uh, how did you? So how do you design architecture to invoke space making and memory, imagination, and reality? Well, I would first say that imagination, in my view, is the most human quality we have. Imagination is still uh, suppressed and not understood uh, in academic education. Uh, there is a uh, historical uh, suspicion about imagination because imagination makes us free and most societies don't want us to be free. So the way to, uh, you know, uh, limit that uh, freedom is to suppress imagination. But uh, the single one uh, task of teaching any cre creative profession is to train the students' imagination, to liberate uh, the imagination. Imagination is so important that we would not even have ethical judgment without imagination. If we cannot imagine the consequences of our alternative choices, we can't make uh, ethical judgments or choices. Um, <clears throat> but uh, there are two kinds of uh, imaginative processes. One is dreaming and one is imagination. Dreaming uh, deals with the uh, sort of subconscious uh, processes and un un in intentionally, whereas imagination is a purposeful uh, projection of the possibilities that exist in here and now in reality uh, in another situation. And uh, we don't, I, I believe we don't, as architects and designers, we don't have much use for dreaming, but we have all the use for imagination, which is based on a, a strong reality sense. Imagination is a projection of uh, reality, whereas dreaming is an alternative reality in, in our dreams. Um, these are mental, uh, mental facts, I would say. Uh, I think imagination can be trained. 
when you read a good book you, that is fantastic training for your imagination and uh, also it reveals the uh, just unbelievable capacity of human imagination. While you read a good novel, you create the entire world that uh, the uh, novel depicts. You create each person, character, you mm, create each room, every building, the city, you mm, continent. Uh, it is just unbelievable uh, what capacities we have in our imagination and good writers uh, reveal that and take advantage of that imagination. A bad writer does not, does not fire your automatic imagination whereas a good one does. I often tell my students that one of the books that has made uh, novels that has made strongest impression on me is Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment. I have visited St. Petersburg maybe 30 times. The last time was a year and a half ago. When I walk in the streets of St. Petersburg, I'm not really experiencing the uh, real St. Petersburg. I'm experiencing St. Petersburg as described by Dostoevsky in his novel 150 years ago. That that's shows the power of uh, uh, literary imagination. So I, I just uh, repeat to say, read good novels that will feed your architectural imagination. Um, you have, uh, in one of your writings, you describe a question that was asked to the scientist Pete Weinberg. Who would you ask about the complexities of life, Shakespeare or Einstein? Yes. And you yourself have said that architecture is strangely suspended between scientific uh, rationality and artistic imagination. Yeah. Yes, uh, Weinberg answered, uh, uh, if, if I'd a, I had a question of simplicity, I would go to Einstein, but if I were to ask uh, a question about the complexity uh, of life, I would go to Shakespeare, uh, which is <laughs> uh, an interesting answer. Um, yes, um, I have thought quite much about uh, the Con contradiction and dialogue between science and art. In many ways, I'm, I'm exactly at that boundary in my own, own thinking. I recently wrote a long essay on Olafur Eliasson, the, the uh, Icelandic Danish artist whose work uh, also is exactly on that borderline. He, takes us with uh, refined scientific thought and methods to a boundary where he lets our uh, senses go uh, in, into the uh, artistic uh, experience uh, uh, to face magic. Uh, in one of his books, uh, Gaston Bachelard, the, the last book he wrote, as, the philo as a philosopher of science, which is entitled The Philosophy of No, No Negation. He explains that uh, the uh, course of uh, scientific thought is a uh, predefined course through seven or eight steps from animism to realism and uh, 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 positivism, etc., to rationalism, and the last phase would be, in his uh, mind, is uh, dialectical rationalism. Uh, well, he was an authoritative, authoritative philosopher of science. Um, I have begun to think that 
art follows the same track, but in the reverse direction. Art tries to go uh, counter the current of scientific thought back to the animistic world, which speaks directly to us, like in animistic cultures, uh, objects and, and nature uh, and landscape speak, speak to us without uh, ideational interpretation through language. So nowadays I, I tend to think about these you know, two uh, currents going in two opposite directions. Uh, and uh, I don't see this as an opposition. I, uh, I find this as a as an, uh, dif fundamental difference in, in primary interest. Uh, science, uh, by definition, uh, takes us away from li lived e e reality into a pure abstraction. Whereas uh, art tries to do the same thing, and particularly in today's culture, which tends to be, be excessively abstract, uh, the, the animistic tendency of uh, art uh, is clear, but also important. Um, so I would say that art and, uh, and science, in a way, they merge into e each other in uh, going to different opposite directions. Yes, this was a sentence he said in a lecture. Uh, I think the year was 1963, but that sentence was like a lightning bolt, uh, and uh, that's the way I have thought about uh, architecture ever since, and uh, this, the meaning and importance of that idea becomes uh, increasingly clear to me. Um, yes, we architects tend to think in terms of aesthetic composition and uh, f functionalized uh, schemes and, uh, and uh, conceptual schemes and uh, things like that. Uh, what my professor intended to say was that in architecture, the underly underlying uh, meaning is always a human lived meaning. And unless as we as architects uh, grasp that meaning or echo that meaning or insert that meaning into our work, it, it is uh, meaningless. Um, well, uh, that's all I would say. Thank you so much for your generosity. Thank you.